psychology is a lot about our thoughts, but it's also a lot about so much more. Not only do we think about our thoughts in isolation, we also think about our thinking when we are in groups. For instance, when we get into groups, we tend to be very vigilant and very attentive to the group norms or the social norms. This is the idea is what is typical behavior? Are people outgoing in this group? Are they more reserved? Are they more polite? Do they like blue humor? Are they very open and vulnerable? Are they very closed off? What are the group norms? We also pay attention really closely to the social roles in a group. Are there leaders? Are there followers? Is there a hierarchy? And this is something our species pays a lot of attention and a lot of energy on. And once we find out what the norms are in a group, and once we find out what the social roles are in the group, we tend to follow what's called a social script. And this is the idea, okay, these are the types of behaviors that I am expected to play out. And this is what others expect from me. Not all of us are good at reading social norms and roles and scripts, but with something we all try to strive towards. And different groups might have very different scripts. For instance, let's say somebody is working in oil and gas. And in oil and gas, the norms are that you don't talk about your feelings, that you appear rough and gruff, that you really promote hegemonic masculinity and toughness, and you support one political viewpoint. And then within that, you might see the roles really divided in that there are certain leaders and certain followers. And if you're a follower, you have to do certain behaviors where you don't tease certain leaders or you only tease people that are below you in the pecking order. Maybe your script is you're gonna drink a certain type of beverage, you're gonna eat a certain type of food, you're gonna show up at work at a certain time and have certain types of conversations. And then outside of your work in oil and gas, let's say on the weekend, you go to a drag show and you're at a drag show where there's lots of drag queen dancers and performers, the norms might be totally different. The way people talk about themselves, the way people dress, the way people behave might be completely different than what they are in the oil and gas workplace. So then the rules you're expected to follow, whether you're an observer or a performer, and the scripts you're supposed to follow are very different. And this is the idea that no matter what type of group we're in, there is certain rules to that group. Now, are these rules set in stone? Are certain people always going to fall into certain roles? Actually, no. We tend to find that when it comes to things, our roles can shift between group and group. And one famous but very controversial study is the Stanford Prison Experiment. And this was conducted by Philip Zimbardo. In this study, he looked at male undergraduate students and screened them all for mental well-being. And everyone in the study was considered to not be a psychopath and not be experiencing a really intense mental illness. So they weren't suicidal. They weren't experiencing a schizophrenic episode. They were all considered to be pretty cognitively, mentally and emotionally healthy individuals. Now, after these very well-adjusted young men signed up for the study, they were randomly chosen to be either prison guards or prison prisoners. And so they got broken into two groups of guards versus prisoners. The basement of the psychology building at Stanford University was formatted and renovated to look like a prison environment with cells and, and skull, solitary confinement and all kinds of interesting things. And they were expected to live down there for about two weeks. And so it was the idea that the guards would guard the prisoners and the prisoners would sit in the cells. What happened was very rapidly, people started to subscribe to their social roles and their scripts very quickly. And this happened in a very extreme way. He found that prisoners started to try and gang up on the guards or the guards started to harass and torture the prisoners. Some prisoners and guards were uh, swapping material and bartering things and, and leaking in contraband. Some prisoners were crying and shaking and throwing up in their cells. They were so panicked, they felt demoralized and marginalized in this experiment. And some guards had become so power hungry, they became nearly psychopathic and overly aggressive and were throwing prisoners in solitary confinement. It was so bad that the study actually had to stop six days in rather than go the full two weeks because of the ethical concern of what was happening in this study. Now, after the study was done, Zimbardo wrote about this and said this was clear evidence of how very well-adjusted people, depending on which group they were assigned to, could become very aggressive overseers or very distraught people who had learned helplessness crying in their cells. And that just by making these imaginary roles, it changed their behavior, it changed their motivation, and it changed them in a very core way. 
in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of writing about this Zimbardo study, and there's been a lot of pushback back and forth in the literature. And some of the concerns that have come forward is the fact that this was really an unethical study, given that it had to end after six days, and how was the debriefing done, and how were those people doing at the end of this, and what kind of oversight did they have that they allowed that much physical harm to come to them? But there's been also been some criticisms, not just about the ethics of the study, but also about the validity of the study. In fact, some previous participants have come out and said that Zimbardo actually manipulated some of the effects. That there was one particular participant who wanted to exit the study and was told they were not allowed to exit the study early, but they wanted to study for their graduate entrance exam. So they actually just um, went wild and went intense to try and get the study to be cancelled so they could go back to their schoolwork, for instance. And so there might have been some experimental effects and some manipulation effects and validity problems with this study. Though Zimbardo still denies a lot of these allegations and the controversy is still alive today. So aside of the Zimbardo study, what else do we know about groups? Well, we know that when we work in groups, we tend to experience group cohesiveness or the group falls apart. But groups that stay together tend to stay together because we support each other. Groups are great for us emotionally and mentally because you're, you're with someone who can vote for you and support you. Groups allow us to socially bond and we need that social bonding is essential to our psychological health. We also know that by participating in groups, it helps us to foster a sense of identity. Our group membership becomes a part of ourselves just as much as our personality is a part of ourselves. And this really helps that as groups stay together, groups become a lot more similar. And one of the big mechanisms for this is homophily or behavioral homophily. And this is the idea that groups become stronger as they encourage its members to behave more similar. So homophily is liking similar things. And so it's the idea that groups that stay together might like the same type of music or li might like the same type of behavior. We also know that antisocial groups or aggressive groups also exhibit homophily in that they tend to encourage their members to go and commit acts of aggression or crimes or delinquent behavior together. So regardless of what type of group you're in, it tends to support each other as the groups bond and become more similar to one another. So groups can be really good. However, there's some problems with groups, such as groupthink. Groupthink is the idea that we stop thinking for ourselves and we really exhibit a shared perspective in the group. Sometimes this is healthy, sometimes it's good to have consensus or to be in a group of people that all see things the same way. And sometimes we like our echo chambers because they support us and validate our perspective. However, sometimes we want to have many minds together instead of just one super brain that says one monolithic idea. And so what happens here, particularly in business, is the idea that when somebody else pitches an idea, it's not what you would prefer, but you can tolerate it, so you go with it. So if you're sitting in a boardroom or with six people in the boardroom and one person pitches an idea, the other five say, yeah, sure, why not? Instead of speaking up or trying to be critical of this. Now, academics may be an exception to this because if you put two academics in a room, you're gonna get at least five different opinions. But in lots of areas, we tend to see this shared perspective. And it's the idea that it's easier to switch your brain off and go with the group rather than to think for yourself. If you took Psych 200 and were in Unit 8 on decision making, we don't like doing the cognitive load of decision making. So we like to reduce our cognitive load and go with what's easier. And so if it's easier just to go with the group rather than stick your neck out, that's what we'll do. The problem with this is it creates a room full of yes people who just say yes to the king or the monarch. And so then what happens, this lack of dissent and dissent becomes deviant and it almost becomes faux pas to speak your mind. It becomes a lot harder. So as groups stay together longer, they're more likely to be on the same page just because of behavioral homophily and they actually are similar, but they will also become similar because of group think and because they've discouraged each other from speaking out. We can imagine historically, if we think about businesses and boardrooms of CEOs and how traditionally we've seen those as rooms full of white men, they just genuinely might have been similar through similar life experiences and working together for decades. And as we see more women and people of color move up into those boardrooms, they may have a different perspective, but being the person who speaks out based on dissent might come at a greater cost to them. And it might be coming more of, and so this ruffling of feathers is a lot more work on the newcomer. And it makes the other people, the old timers feel greatly uncomfortable because they're shaking up things when they've been so used to this consensus process. So groupthink is not considered to be a positive thing. 
In addition, another outcome of groups is social loafing. And social loafing often called the group project effect. This is the idea that if you're in a room full of four or five people and you're going to do a project together, you all sort of assume the other people are going to take on more than they will. Or if there's a task on a sign, you hope somebody else will sort of stand up and take it on. Now, some people in the group will, of course, say, oh, I know I'm doing all this work. I'll just do the whole project myself and you'll get credit. But they're the minority. Most of us in a group will start to loaf and expect other people to pick up the slack. We have a skewed perspective of the workload and a skewed perspective of the work contrib contributions. And we're just waiting for the other people to pick up the ball. Now, even if in the workplace you're the one that takes on the tasks, you might find yourself social loafing in other areas. You might wait for your roommate to do the dishes rather than doing it yourself. And as your roommate is waiting for you to do the dishes, for instance. And this is the idea that you're putting it off and putting it off. And this causes groups to be less productive than individuals. This is the idea that if we assign an individual project to, let's say, create a poster, the individual knows what they have to do and they have good control and management over their individual project. Versus if we ask a group to make a poster project for a university, it tends to be less well done than the individuals. It's less coherent, it's done more at the last minute, and it's done with a lot more animosity. And so group work is harder than individual work and it takes a lot more skills to do it properly. Now social loafing can also cause the spin-off effect known as the bystander effect. And the bystander effect is the idea that when something needs to be done, when something needs to be taken action against, we expect other people to take that action. And this gets exacerbated as there's more people and as we feel more anonymous in a crowd. One example of the bystander effect is the murder of Kitty Genovese. So this is a very famous account of an individual woman who was murdered on the streets through stabbing, and lo, there was 38 witnesses. So in a lot of recounts of this, the woman was attacked in the streets and was stabbed multiple times with the assailant leaving and coming back, leaving and returning multiple times throughout the night and continuing to assault her. And so although there was at least 38 witnesses, many accounts claimed that there was no one who called the police and no one who stood up or tried to stop the murder. Everybody watched from their homes, assuming other people had taken action, assuming other people would do the right thing. So they did not have to. So the bystander effect is the idea that you stand on the sidelines and you watch and you don't become active in the situation because you assume other people will. We might see this play out day to day if you're on something like public transit and you, you see an altercation and you do not hit the help bar or you do not text for help because you assume other people will. And so this is the idea that you kind of hang back assuming other people will have the control. Yes, there is the minority of us who are the 100% call the cops every time, but we are the minority. And so the majority of people will stand back and assume that other people will take action.